the reason we put these on is because in the way I approach this presentation tonight, we'll take maybe the next 30, 35 minutes and then we'll go in and have dinner. Um, I approach this for business school graduates, uh, although uh, anybody here graduating this semester? Yes? Okay. Um, this is good information for anybody that's in college, especially in a business program. Um, I approach the, this presentation from um, the standpoint of a business dinner. Uh, a lot of times when you're um, trying to find a job, part of that interview might be um, a social dinner. And uh, your behavior and your manners tell a lot about you. Um, so that's how I approach that. So I'll go through it and, and kind of assume that maybe you're going to be um, in the near future sitting down to dinner with somebody you're interviewing with and trying to get a job with this organization. We won't be, di we won't be dining this way like ants do here. Some nice sweet syrup there. Okay, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about some different um, service techniques. And some of these you may have seen, some you may never see. Um, and let, me back, let me back up. Um, when, I was, when I was in college, I went to Cornell University, the hotel school there. And as part of a graduate course that I took there, um, the professor was good friends with the general manager of the Sheridan Boston, which I think is still the largest. Come on in. <laughs> I think the Sheridan Boston is still the largest hotel in Boston. And as part of this course, it was called Management Operations, the whole class went to Boston, we spent a week there, and we shadowed, each one of the, each one of the class members shadowed a department manager for a week. And during the week, um, we really got to see what hotel operations were like in a 2,000 room hotel. Um, I think about midweek, the professor was good friends with the general manager of the Ritz-Carlton Boston. Um, and the, Ritz, the, the general manager of the Ritz-Carlton Boston was a graduate or an alumnus of uh, the Cornell Hotel School. So he invited the whole class, I think there was only 12 in the class, he invited the whole class um, over for a cocktail reception and a dinner that he paid for. And this is in the Ritz-Carlton Boston, and if you've ever been to Boston, now there are two Ritz-Carltons. The old Ritz-Carlton is on one side of the Boston Commons, the, other, the newer Ritz-Carlton is on the other side of the Boston Commons. Um, we ate at the old Ritz-Carlton, which is, at the time was the only Ritz-Carlton in Boston. And that particular hotel, the dining room at the Ritz-Carlton, was the place where if you had a lot of money and you, want, you had a special occasion and you wanted to celebrate it with a meal, you went to the Ritz-Carlton Boston. Very, very fancy. Um, so anyway, we, we dressed up, coat and ties, the gentlemen, the ladies in shirts or skirts. Um, and we went in our business attire and we went to this suite in the hotel and we had a cocktail reception with people, waiters walking around with trays of hors d'oeuvres and um, people walking around with trays of champagne and they'd ask if you wanted a, a t some type of a drink. Um, it was pretty fancy and we were like, wow, we're serving them uh, hors d'oeuvres. Um, so then we went into the dining room and we sat all at one table, one big round table. And they served us in the Russian style. I still remember what I ate there. I ate uh, beef wellington. If you're not familiar with what, be what beef wellington is, beef wellington is a, a tenderloin um, wrapped in puff pastry. Well, at first it's tenderloin covered with uh, um, a mushroom pate foie gras, um, what they call a duck cell, and uh, it's basically duck liver pate. It's covered uh, the meat, and then they cover it with a puff pastry dough and then they bake it off in the oven. And then they slice it and they serve it with, uh, uh, usually I think it was a, a sauce, uh, sauce bordelaise or a sauce Robert, I think it was. Um, very fancy. Um, I remember it was probably the best meal I've ever had. But the thing that, that kind of freaked me out was the fact that we were sitting at this, this table. I've never seen so many wine glasses and uh, silverware utensils and plates. And if you look over here behind you on the sideboard here, um, it looked like this, except with fancy linen on the tables and napkins. And um, I was kind of going, wow, this is pretty fancy. And they served us in the Russian service method, which you don't see very often. Um, maybe some restaurants still use it or private clubs. But the Russian service is where all the food is basically prepared in the kitchen. 
and brought out on fancy platters. And the wait staff with one arm and their left arm here, they have the platter here, and their right hand, um, they have a, uh, a large fork and spoon. And let's say it, uh, um, it's a fish or whatever, they are serving everything from the platter from, if it was this gentleman here, they would be um, serving from his left onto his plate here. They'd be serving, and um, that's how it's served. Then you go to the next person, and they'd serve that, that person. And that's how they served the Russian service method. And I didn't know what they were doing at first. And they all, they would set up on the sideboard, and all the items were prepared on platters, and then they'd do all their work, and then you go back to the sideboard and bring the next course. And um, it's a pretty fancy, you don't see it very often, but you should be familiar with it anyway. The other French, uh, the other service technique is a French service technique, which you also don't see very often anymore. Um, it's, qu it's quite expensive for restaurants to provide this type of service. Generally, it may take two wait staff per table, uh, two wait staff per table. And uh, they, in the French service method, they use a guéridon, gué that's my, my French is not that good, guéridon, um, and a guéridon is basically a table where they have a burner on there and they have a warmer for the plates and all their ingredients. And you may see it in some restaurants today with uh, things like flambe desserts, um, like baked Alaska, Cherry's Jubilee, Bananas Foster, where they're actually flaming the dessert table side. Um, you may see it with things like Caesar salad where they bring all the ingredients out and right next to your table they're preparing the Caesar salad. It's kind of fun to watch and it's a way for wait staff. You generally get very large tips for doing that kind of service. Um, that's the French service method. Then we have also have the English service method, and that's kind of the service method that I grew up with because my family, or my grandmother was from England, and it was that was the method she used for um, my father, and then it was passed down to our family. And there were six children, and we sat around a table every night with six children, my parents, and. Uh, all the items were basically prepared in the kitchen, brought out in platters and placed by my father. And then he had the plates stacked next to him and he served all the food and he passed it down the table. And that's the English method. You probably wouldn't see that in a restaurant, but you may see it in a private club. You may see it in a private club. And then the last uh, method, which is the one that you're most familiar with, is the American service technique. And that's where everything is plated in the kitchen and they're brought out at individual plates and set in front of you, um, and that's, that's the American service method. And that's probably the one that you're going to see most of the time, but I mentioned the other three methods because they're not completely dead, and you may uh, be, be taken to a very fancy club someday, and maybe the, one of these methods there, and you're not kind of all nervous. You, you know what's going on. You know what's going on. Okay, whether you're having lunch with a prospective employer or dinner with a business associate, your manners speak volumes about you as professionals. So your level of sophistication, a lot of times it, it is kind of a test. It's kind of a test to see how sophisticated you are. I remember uh, I, I moved here to Plattsburgh in 1987. I was the vice president of support services at CVPH Medical Center. And I remember going, I think I've been there about a year, and uh, we went on a planning retreat, the senior management team, with the president, the chief operating officer, all the vice presidents, and uh, we spent uh, three days in at the Sagamore in Lake George, a uh, very fancy resort. At that time, they had a restaurant there called the Trillium. It was a very fancy French restaurant. And the, uh, C the, the CEO president gave me the wine list because he knew I had a degree in hospitality. He said, Bob, you pick out the wine. And uh, I said, okay, fine. I said, and I tried to get an idea of what everybody was eating so I could kind of match up the wines. And I was looking at the wine list and he said, he said, get, a, get a, uh, a couple of good burgundies, a couple of good French burgundies. Um, so I was looking under France, under burgundy, and I picked out, I, I looked at them, and then I looked over at the price. The cheapest burgundy they had, French burgundy on the wine list, was $95 a bottle. Uh, the most expensive one was like $195. And so I, um, remembering back my business etiquette, um, I was going to order the $95 bottles. The president wanted the burgundy and I wasn't going to order the most expensive one. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, don't order the most expensive item on the menu when you're out for a business dinner. So I, I said, well, we have two bottles of this particular French burgundy. And the president leaned over and said, no, get the good stuff. We don't do this very often. 
So um, I actually got to order two $195 bottles of wine. And they're very good, but, um, but keep that in mind. Don't order the most expensive unless the boss gives you that permission. Once you are at the table, napkin use. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to follow the host's lead. Generally, when you sit down, you're, go you're going to take your napkin off the table and put it in your lap. Now, if it's a smaller napkin, you put the whole napkin on your lap. If it's a big napkin, you might have it folded in half, and you put that on your lap. But generally, you'll wait to the host. Um, you'll follow their lead. Um, and your napkin remains on your lap throughout the entire meal, unless you are wiping your mouth. And when you're wiping your mouth, I shouldn't say wipe. You're basically gent gently blotting your mouth. So you're not like this. You're blotting your mouth. Um, if you need to leave the table, place the napkin on the chair and push your chair into the table. That signifies to the wait staff that you are not done with your meal. Um, if you put your napkin on the table, they may think, oh, they're done, they left, I'm going to clear their stuff. So put it on your chair, put it underneath, that tells the wait staff that you're still there, you may have gotten up to go to the bathroom. Um, the host will signal the end of the meal by placing the napkin on the table. Uh, do the same, don't wad it up, just place it neatly to the right of your plate. So um, it stays on your lap during the course of the meal, and then when you're done, after you see the uh, host put his napkin on the table, basically signifying that the meal's over, um, you do the same. And you kind of uh, fold it up and put it to the right of your plate. When you're ordering food, um, if you don't know what, something's, what something is, don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, I think it was about six years ago, uh, we went to a very fancy uh, restaurant with some of our faculty members up in uh, St. Jean, Quebec, up on the Richelieu River. And actually, uh, coincidentally, the name of the restaurant was Samuel D., the same name as we have um, for our restaurant here. And it was a very fancy French restaurant. Everything was in French. Um, and one of the faculty members ordered something he thought he knew what it was, but it ended up being, um, what was it, calves brains, calves brains. And when it was brought out to him, he couldn't eat it. He tried, and then he finally asked the wait staff, what is this? And he explained that it was calves brains. And he said, oh, I can't eat that. And the wait staff was very nice about the fact um, that he couldn't eat that, but he, he said, would you like us to make something else for you? But the problem was that we'd already finished our meal, so he was going to have to wait another 15, 20 minutes to get them, have them prepare something else. So basically, he paid for a, a pretty uh, expensive meal that he couldn't eat because he really should have asked, what is this? Um, generally, the, um, the host is going to probably ask you to go ahead and order. And he may suggest, if he knows the restaurant well, he may suggest, hey, you've got to try the prime rib here. It's very good. Or he may suggest an item that he recommends. And in that case, if you want to order that, go ahead. Um, if the host does not order an appetizer, don't order an appetizer. Remember, this is a business dinner. This is a business dinner. Hopefully, you're conducting business or you're there to get a position in the organization. So appetizers, now if, the, if your host says, go ahead and order, you've got to try these appetizers. They're, so, they're really good. So if the host says, I'm going to get one, then you go ahead and order an appetizer. Same thing with desserts. Same thing with desserts. If uh, don't order dessert, unless the host orders dessert and you really want dessert, um, I would not order dessert. Stay away from messy foods. And when I say messy foods, if you're at a... Um, um, a Western barbecue type place, I'd stay away from the, the ribs or things that you would be expected to use your hands to eat, your fingers, uh, like fried chicken or something like that. Um, definitely uh, stay away from the, the, uh, um, the barbecued ribs. I mean, if you can imagine eating ribs with your hands and you're going to have barbecue sauce over your hands and all over your mouth and pieces of meat sticking out of your teeth probably later on. So those things are kind of out. I'd also stay away from things like, uh, for example, lobster. Those can get messy. And when you're using a lobster cracker or something like that, sometimes uh, some of the juice goes flying and you get butter. And those things can get kind of sloppy. And as I mentioned, stay away from the most expensive item on the menu. I, I, I should have asked, um, how many people when they were growing up 
sat down on a regular basis almost every evening and had dinner with their family at a dining room table. How many people kind of fend, fended for yourself for dinner? Yeah, that's uh, becoming more and more common with uh, both parents a lot of times uh, working, uh, different types of hours. Uh, a lot of people didn't grow up with uh, the occasion to sit down with their family. So things that uh, you were taught as a child maybe weren't taught. Um, and it's becoming more and more common for people to be on their own, you know, pull something out of the freezer, throw it in the microwave or something like that, and you eat, eat sitting uh, in the, on the couch watching television. Okay, basic table setup. Um, if you look at this, We've got a plate in the middle, a plate generally about two inches from the edge of the table. Uh, sometimes you'll see your napkin to the left with a fork set on it. Um, and then your knife and the blades always pointing in towards the plate. And then a spoon. And then you have a drinking glass. Um, that's a basic table setting. That's just a basic table setting. Now we'll go to a little bit fancier table setting. Here, number five, we probably have, um, maybe that's a plate. This number six would be called a charger plate. And if I go over here and demonstrate, um, a charger plate is a large plate. Sometimes you'll see in fancy restaurants, they're silver. And that's basically a plate that things are set on. Um, so that stays there. It's called a charger plate. And then when they bring out, um, maybe they're bringing out uh, an appetizer, maybe on a plate like this be set on your charger plate. Uh, if we go to um, one, that's your napkin again. Sometimes you'll see the napkin when you first sit down be right on the plate. Um, two, <clears throat> that is a fork. And that's probably going to be a fork used for the first thing served that you would eat something with a fork. Now, now this might get confusing to you. But a good way to remember it, to make it simple, is, uh, is to work from the outside in. Work from the outside in. So if they bring out something like your salad, your salad comes out and it's set on your charger plate, you know uh, you eat salad with a fork. I hope you know that. Um, you go to number two. That's the fork you're going to use. That's the fork you're going to use. And when you're done with your salad, they will clear your salad plate and they'll clear that fork with it. And um, if the next course comes and it's something you eat with a fork, um, you go to number three. And then this one probably is going to be maybe a dessert fork. A dessert fork. Same thing with the knives. Um, you would work from, or from on the right hand side of the plate. Your spoons go to the right of your knife. We know that the first course coming out may um, entail using a spoon. If there's more than one spoon, you always start with the one on the outside. They'll set it up in order like that. Um, and then this knife will be to the next course, and then this knife will be to the next course. Um, if you go to number 12, they may have preset silverware for dessert. So that's what uh, number 12 is. If you go to number 11, that's your bread plate with the, uh, uh, bread, uh, the butter knife on the bread plate. Um, 50, or 13, 14, and 15 are um, your wine and water. Now if we go over here, we look at this setup here. Um, I've got a water glass here. So, um, and I'll get give you an example. Last week, um, Samuel Dees and the HRT uh, program, the Advanced Restaurant Operations uh, course, uh, puts on a five-course wine dinner every semester. It's uh, $65 per person, and they do five courses and five different wines, a different wine with each course. Sometimes so, instead of a wine, it's a champagne. Um, so we had the table set up like this last week with um, actually a water glass and five wine glasses. This is the water glass that we use here at Samuel D's. Um, this is a white wine glass. This is a standard white wine shaped glass. This is another white wine glass. Um, this is more of a uh, Riesling, German style um, white wine shape. This is a 24 ounce Bordeaux glass for French Bordeaux wines. So you drink things like Cabernet Sauvignon, um, Syrah, those type of wines in a glass like this. And the reason they're so big is it allows, there's a lot of bouquet and aroma, it allows you to swirl the wine around and catch that aroma 
and the bouquet so you can sniff the wine. And this is more of a burgundy style glass right here. It's got a wider bowl, but it's also large. I think this is 22 ounces. Now the way they're set up on a table like this will determine um, which wines in which order. Because they'll start, here's your water here, your first wine with the first course is going to go in this glass, second, third, and fourth. And that's the way they'll set them up. Now, um, a lot of restaurants don't go to all that trouble to set up um, the, the, play, the place settings like that in advance. You'll go and um, they'll just have um, a basic table setting and then they'll clear that away and they'll bring the next, all the utensils and everything for the next course. So you may not see that. But if you do go to a formal dinner, a restaurant like that, we see all these glasses and silverware, um, don't freak out. Just remember, work from the outside in. Also remember that um, everything on your right is liquid. So if you drew a line right down the center here, left food, right liquid. So when you've got, if you go to a banquet or if you're in a crowded uh, table setting and your bre bread plate is over here and um, you will look at that bread and you go, wait, wait a minute, there's a bread plate here and there's one over here. Which one's mine? Just remember, liquid on the right, food on the left. So the blood plate on the left is yours. So when you go into to, um, this evening into Samuel D's, you'll have a bread plate set up to the left of your plate. And there'll be a, um, what we call a bread basket or a French term, uh, ravioli. Um, you'll have bread, uh, fresh, fresh baked uh, bread in this. And um, you'll take some. And then you'll look, which one am I going to go, right or left? Left, right? Okay. Again, I, I just mentioned possible clues. Um, if you look at the table setting, it gives you clues about what might be served. Liquids on your right, solids on your left. Work your way in. Dessert, spoon, and fork sometimes are up at the top. Um, cutting. Um, there's two different ways of cutting your food. <clears throat> there's the English method or European method versus the American method. So if I have a, um, um, a piece of meat on this plate here, the um, European method would be I would cut off a piece. It's not like when we were kids where we take a piece of meat and we cut it up into 20 pieces and then we go to work at it. Um, you cut one, one, one or two pieces at a time in the European method, you use your left hand with the tines of the fork down into your mouth. That's the European method. Um, you don't switch hands. The American method is you cut your meat, then you lay your fork down, and you switch hands and put it in your right, if you're right-handed, you put it in with your right hand. So you're going you're gonna to cut your piece of meat, I'm sorry, lay your, your knife down, not your fork. And then you switch hands and your fork and your right hand into your mouth with the tines up. Um, both are um, perfectly uh, permissible. Um, I grew up with an American style of cutting and switching hands. Um, although I, I know my grandmother would sit at the table and uh, she was from England and she, she was the European style and she put it right in with her left hand with the tines pointed down. When you're finished, don't push your plate away. Um, don't push your plate away. What you do with your utensils, you go with your fork and knife, goes to a 10 and 4, 10 o'clock, 4 o'clock position on your plate. So you would put your fork like that, or your knife like that, point into 10 and 4 o'clock, and then your fork underneath that with the tines down. That is the proper way to put your silverware back on the plate when you're finished. That tells the wait staff in a fancy restaurant um, that you are done. You're done. And they can clean your, clear your plate away. Once you've used a piece of silverware, don't put it on the table. Um, because it's going to have some food soil on it, and it's going to soil the tablecloth. So put it on, the, uh, on your plate, not on the table. Not on the table. And I've seen in some very fancy French restaurants, in fact, it was at the Sagamore in uh, Lake George, the Trillium, um, they had, in their French restaurant, they had this little 
glass, it looked like a barrel, little glass barrel on, with legs on it. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what it was. And nobody at the table knew what it was either. We finally asked the wait waiter, what is this thing? And they said, that's to rest your, uh, your utensil on so it doesn't touch the tablecloth. So the French came up with something so it wouldn't touch the tablecloth. Um, do not leave spoons in a cup. Place on the saucer. So if you have soup, then you're done with your soup. Don't leave your spoon like that. Put it on the saucer like this. So it's not sticking up out of the cup. A couple of uh, basic things on table manners. Uh, doggy bags. Remember, this is a dinner, a business dinner. Um, and you might be trying to get a job. You're not um, going to say, look, can I have a do doggy bag for the stuff that you couldn't finish? Um, so don't ask for a doggy bag. Um, stay away from finger foods again. Alcoholic beverages. Um, you know, it used to be uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was standard business practice to go out and have uh, um, a couple of martinis during lunch. Um, that's frowned upon these days. In fact, I have a friend that went to Plattsburgh State. He's retired now. He, he was here at Plattsburgh State in 1967, and he used to be, uh, I forget the president of the university at that time. His job, he used to work, he did part-time work um, in the president's office when it was in Kehoe. He said, my job, one of my jobs was to bring in the drink cart at lunch. And he said all the, the higher administrators would have martinis at lunch. So well, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> Anyway, back to alcoholic beverages. Um, I would stay away from any alcohol at a business dinner. Now, at a dinner, um, especially at a lunch, at a dinner, um, if your host says, I'm going to have a glass of wine, you're welcome to have one. Um, that's okay. But I, I'd limit it to one glass of wine. I wouldn't say, uh, no, give me a double wild turkey on the rocks. That's something that guy would go, wow, this guy's a heavy drinker. So I'd stay away from the alcoholic beverages and definitely no more than one. Uh, smoking. Um, well, restaurants don't allow you to smoke anymore in restaurants, but if you are a smoker, don't smoke before you come to this dinner because um, smoking, uh, the smell of smoke for, to a non-smoker, you can smell it a mile away and it stays in your clothes and your hair um, and it's a real turnoff for somebody that's a non-smoker. So um, make sure you don't smoke, um, at least before the dinner. And posture, no slouching. I think it's common sense. Uh, back straight, sit up straight. Um, elbows off the table. Now, some places, uh, you know, they say, oh, elbows on the table is okay. Um, I say elbows off the table, and that's my English upbringing. I remember my grandmother had a wooden spoon. Um, Bobby, Bobby, young and able, keep your elbows off the table. And if I didn't get them off, she whacked me one with a wooden spoon. So um, I always never put my elbows on the table. So I would suggest you don't do the, do the same. Um, seasoning your food. Um, I would not overly season your food and definitely don't season your food before you've tasted it. And people ask me, what, what is he talking about? Um, IBM, um, which you're all familiar with. IBM, when they take somebody to a dinner um, for an, in an interview situation, that's one of the tests. They're recording this. If they catch somebody seasoning their food before they've tasted it, um, that rules you out. That's, that's a black mark. They say it, it shows poor planning skills. Now, I don't know where they come up with this, but uh, um, I'm sure some psychologist has done some study. But IBM uses that. So don't season your food before you've tasted it. They say it uh, um, shows poor planning skills. Um, chewing with your mouth closed. Your mouth closed when you're chewing. Don't talk with, your, uh, with food in your mouth. Um, slurping. In the U.S., slurping is not considered proper. Some countries, slurping is, is permittable. Um, I know we have some Asian students here. Are, where are you from? Japan. Uh, are you allowed to, when you go eat so soba soup, can you slurp? Um, in, you know, what, I'm, you know I'm, what I mean, slurping, right? Is it considered okay to slurp? In Japan. <clears throat> in Japan, yes. Okay. Where are you from? Same. Japan. Japan. And where are you from? China. You're from China. Can you slurp in China? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. In some countries, it's okay. 
because uh, if your soba soup is a big thick uh, uh, noodle in a soup, and it's sometimes hard with a chopstick, so you, you get it started and then you slurp it, like uh, we did when we were kids in the spaghetti. Maybe we still do, I don't know. Uh, food caught in your teeth. That happens, especially if uh, um, maybe you're eating uh, um, a piece of meat, might have some fat or gristle, sometimes it gets caught in your teeth. And um, I would definitely try to not wrestle with it at the table. I'd get up and excuse myself and say, I have to go to the bathroom, I'll be right back, and then do it in the bathroom to get it out. Um, and that's what I'm talking about. This, this word here is gristle. Gristle is a piece of uh, fat. Um, rolls and bread. When you're, uh, when you're buttering your bread, you take um, butter, and the way we serve our butter, and most restaurants do it in some similar fashion. This is the way we do it in Samuel D's here. This container will have butter flowerettes in it that we use a pastry bag. It's a, basically a compound butter with some herbs in it. And we use a pastry bag, and we, um, we uh, squeeze out a flourette of butter, and then we put it in the freezer. And then we put ice in this and put this on it, and it's holes here, and put the butter in there and put it on there so the butter stays cold. Um, so you're, gonna, you're going to be taking some of the butter there and you put it on your, on your uh, bread plate. Don't butter from here onto your piece of bread. Put it on your bread plate and then push this away and then you uh, might break off one piece of bread at a time and then butter it and put it in your mouth. You're not buttering the whole thing up and cutting it up into 10 different pieces. Um, leaving the table, if you have to leave the table again, put your napkin on your chair, push it underneath the, uh, um, the table and excuse yourself. Um, going to the bathroom or being sick, you definitely have to excuse yourself. Um, and you know, it may happen. There may be something you ate that just doesn't agree with you or something. That's why don't order something strange. Uh, go with the tried and true things that you know what it tastes like. Um, reaching for items, please, thank you. Please pass the salt, please pass the pepper, please pass the bread, bread basket. Um, silverware on the floor, if you drop something on the floor, if you can reach it, yes, pick it up. And uh, then ask the wait staff to, if you could bring you a new uh, utensil. Um, sending food back, not on this kind of meal. And business dining, you know, this isn't the time to say, look, uh, um, could you redo this? This isn't cooked like I said. You know, suffer through it. Remember, this, you're not there to eat. This is a business dinner. Um, you're conducting business or trying to get a job over a meal. Um, saying grace um, or a prayer before dinner. Some of us are religious. Um, say a prayer before dinner. Um, please apologize to God or whoever and, and say it later. Say it twice. But don't do it at a dinner. I remember um, I was, this wasn't a business dinner, but I, when I was at CBPH Medical Center, I we had a chief operating officer who had just been hired. His first day on the job, uh, I went by his office. I figured, well, I'm, you know, ask him if he wants to go down to the cafeteria and grab some lunch with a couple of other of the uh, um, <clears throat> senior management team. So I said, hey, you want to go grab some lunch down in the cafeteria? We're heading down. He said, oh, yeah, OK, thank you. So he came down, and we went through the, the line, and the cafeteria line, and we sat down at a table. And I was sit sitting across from him. And all of a sudden, his head was like this, and he had his hand over his eyes, and I thought he was crying. And I, I started talking to him, and he just, he just stayed there like that. And then all of a sudden, he said, oh, okay. And then I realized he was saying a prayer. He was very religious, and he said a prayer before his meal. But I felt very uncomfortable, and I, I, it made me feel uncomfortable. So if you are the type of person that has to say grace before um, you eat, um, I'd say it afterwards and say it twice. He'll understand. I hope so. Ten Commandments, thou shalt not jump straight into business talk. There's going to be a social aspect to that, so don't jump right into the, the business aspect. Don't be late. Be early. Don't table hop. Um, you see somebody in the restaurant, oh, excuse me. I go over and say hello to this person. Um, this isn't the time to be doing that. Um, some things you want to stay away from as far as conversation. Politics. Do not talk politics. Do not talk diets. And don't talk religion. These are things that are taboo to somebody that is more or less a stranger to you. Um, 
So don't, don't get involved in political, diet, or religion. Those are three subjects you want to stay away from, not only at a business dinner, but in an interview. Um, don't dominate the conversation. Um, if you're interviewing for a job, they like to do the talking. So let them talk. Let them go. Don't dawdle over ordering or eating. Uh, excuse me, I need another five or ten minutes. To, I can't make up my mind. Just pick out something and order it. Don't drink too much alcohol. Don't fight over the bill. The host, realize, the host is going to pick up the bill. If you were invited as part of an interview, um, if you were invited to dinner, it's expected that the host is going to pick up the bill, not you. So don't fight over the bill. And don't forget to show appreciation. Within 24 hours, send a thank you note. And I, and I you know, a lot of people are, it's so easy today to text something or uh, email. Um, I like to see a handwritten note, not even typed. I like to see a handwritten thank you note. Thank you so much for dinner last night. Had a great time. I really enjoyed talking with you. I'm really excited about the future of your company, and I want to be a part of that. Um, just two or three lines and thank you, and that's, it, it means a great deal. It really means a great deal. These are just some different utensils that you may run into. Um, here we've got a, uh, <clears throat> a fish fork and knife. And they may bring out, if it's uh, fish, uh, they may bring out an additional plate for bones when the fish is a filet and it's not deboned. And a fish fork is a little bit shorter and it's got a sharp tip on it and um, the, the fork is also a little bit shorter also. Uh, lob lobster, if you're eating lobster, um, not something I'd, I'd suggest, but if your boss brings you to a lobster house and that's all they serve, um, and you're eating lobster, you may have a lobster fork some tongs and a small knife. And that's what these utensils are right here. And this is the, uh, the pick right here where you're trying to pick the lobster out of the shell. Um, dessert silverware, I've mentioned that already. That might be a, above the plate and napkin. For uh, cremes, mousses, and ice creams, a coffee spoon is sufficient. So that would be a set above like that. For fresh fruit, small knife and a small fork. So it'll be set across in the, um, horizontally. This is your fish knife right here. See, that's a different type of shape. Here's a coffee spoon, espresso spoon, very, very small. Um, this would be an uh, espresso spoon. See, it's pretty small. This is a demitasse, which is an espresso cup. Snail tongs, escargot. Anybody ever had escargot snails? These are, uh, you squeeze that, opens up, and then you fit it around the shell. That way your, your, your shell's not scooting all over the place. And then you, you have a special small little fork. You take the meat out of the, the snail shell. This is the snail fork right here. Lobster tongs, lobster fork. Dinner fork. See the fish fork, it's a little bit shorter. Cake fork, only three times. I think we have, there's a cake, cake fork right here, just three times here. Soup spoon, a little bit larger. Again, teaspoon and sauce spoon um, is a little bit flatter, just a little bit flatter. Now again, you're probably not gonna run into a lot of these things in most restaurants, but who knows down the road. Any questions? Getting hungry? Okay. Let's go on in for dinner.